Go the other direction, man. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be here with you this afternoon. And Dr. Beebe, we all thank you for all the activities of the day and the purpose behind them to celebrate this great occasion. My first reaction upon hearing the panels earlier in the day was that my colleagues had been writing very thoughtful responses over the weekend while I was still writing out E-flat clarinet parts to various hymns uh, to be used this morning, um, thinking that perhaps then I was going to be at a disadvantage. And then I remembered that uh, one of the essential skills in the humanities, and certainly in my area of it in music, that is always called forth is that of improvisation. <laughs> As we are currently undergoing a review by the National Association of Schools of Music for accreditation, that is one of the areas that they make you demonstrate your curriculum is adequate in. So for students that are here today, I want to be a living example for that uh, very skill that we are, we are called to do. And my third thought was that, well, perhaps then I should really employ my craft and make, if not perhaps the most uh, erudite uh, talk this afternoon, that I should sing my talk and make it the most memorable, one that you wouldn't forget at least the manner it was uh, presented. And then I was reminded that Marilyn did not offer hers in free verse and thought, well, <laughs> um, we'll back up a little bit on that. But as the humanities, and specifically in the area of the arts, and even more microcosmically the area of music responds and reacts to the global imperative, it reminds me that we have always done so when we have been at our very best. And as we are called to be at our very best, we are called to emulate that historic tradition of responding to a global imperative in our work. And from my small view of that in music, I can see those examples that resonate most dramatically and precisely. If you look at some of the great careers of musicians and the products that they have produced for our culture, we can take those that had a very broad cultural perspective as those that are still lasting and meaningful to us in our contemporary culture. We would not have, for instance, a Handel's Messiah had Handel not been a world citizen, at least of the world that he could engage and that he knew. The counterpoint crafted in his youth in the highly disciplined training of the German school of musicians was influenced greatly by his journeys to Italy to learn the florid language of Italian melody, of the expressive character of that music and that style, and then wrought to a very practical, economically driven, business-oriented realization of what his music must mean to a culture and a society on arriving in England and having his opera company go bankrupt, when he could no longer produce Italian opera, when the trips to Germany were cut off because his old patron in Germany was now the king of England and he had nowhere to go but here in London, to find music that spoke to a contemporary society. And the music that he found most interestingly that spoke to the contemporary society still speaks to us today in the Hallelujah Chorus or in the entire rendering of the life of Messiah through that great oratorio and one of only 16 that he wrote on major biblical topics because he had a worldview about his music that reached into his craft and his art and allowed him to respond with a broader, more potent voice that didn't just speak to English suburbanites or English royalty, but continues to speak in a worldwide way, both in its original context and in its many mutations in many cultures as this music is changed, turned, and wrought into everything from the gospel messiah to the rock messiah to forms of Asian and South American music that still speak with Handel as a core. There was a, a very large movement in the 1950s and 60s of, uh, 60s of worldwide Bach revival. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach appeared on the cover of Time magazine in about 1962 with the title, The Fifth Evangelist. And it wasn't because he had any new words or it wasn't as though he, we were discovering the Q gospel in some hidden uh, reserve in, uh, in a cave outside of Palestine but rather because Bach was taking the gospel as we know it and translating it in the 18th century into a language that would be penetrating and powerful to a world culture today. And the attribution of fifth evangelist came as his music was impacting Eastern society and a great religious revival and a great sense of conversion, to borrow from Charlie's analogy, was coming to a Japanese culture because the music of Bach had a certain order, a certain sophistication of intellect that appealed to that culture and sweeping waves of people brought to an understanding of what the gospel meant and to many to faith through that witness and that music. Interestingly, if we keep listening, we hear that 
wave coming back to us in the music of the contemporary uh, Japanese composer Tan Dun and Chinese composer Tan Dun and his Water Passion, which was written on an inspiration of hearing the Bach St. Matthew Passion and is now returned to us in an entirely new iteration with a different timeless voice. As Bach's music is constrained by its rhythmic cohesiveness and its counterpoint, the music of Tan Dun and his expression of the passion is freed, is liberated by a world music that is not constrained by those same rhythmic and temporal boundaries that hangs in the air and makes us listen and feel not just the few hours on the cross, but the experience and impact of the cross upon our generations and a timeless scope of human experience. We've always seen that interaction go back and forth, and I will say, uh, in regard to the a practical application of the humanities and music that Vivaldi was educating young girls in Venice back in about 1720 as, as his principal form of employment was at the Ospedale, uh, just past the Bridge of Sorrows, if you've been there and looked to the left. And uh, you'll note that that was his principal work was, in, was bringing value to that part of his society that had little value, uh, young female orphans that could then contribute to society in a meaningful way through that instruction. So we're in that with all of you economists uh, wanting to do that. I think broadly, and all of my colleagues in the humanities have spoken to this, that the humanities exist not in preference to the other disciplines that have spoken today or that we serve with on a daily basis, but we exist in partnership with them in part because we can't exist without them. Hopefully, the dialogue that comes in a culturally enriching environment informs them also that they can't exist without us, that we are codependent as disciplines, we are codependent as areas of emphasis in a liberal arts college. If I look at the music of Heinrich Schutz back to the 16th and 17th century, we can see the effects of the 30 years war on his work. If you look through the complete opus of Schutz's composition, we see rich, vital music written in his early years as he grew up in the courts of northern Germany and how it was enriched and incredibly accelerated in his creativity as he moved to, as he was sent by his boss to Italy to study the new forms of counterpoint of the Gabrielles. And he came back with multiple choirs and new sorts of dissonance and new sorts of harmonic resolution and new sorts of melodic language. And it, it sparked incredible renaissance of music making and composition in Germany because one man had made the journey and had traveled to another culture and brought it home. And then the Thirty Years' War came, and the books of Heinrich Schütz become very slim, and they're called the Kleine Geistliche Konzert, to use another language, thank you, Ralph, that's good, <laughs> which are the little holy concertos, uh, because there were so few musicians for him to compose for. And so instead of vast orchestras and sweeping multiple choirs, written for two voices that could be accomplished by children, and two violins that could be played by old men who were too old to go to the Thirty Years' War. A vast change. Then at the, at the close of that war and the resources coming back into the possible creativity for his culture, the books expand again and we see the great range of music coming back in the works of Heinrich Schutz. So we're in it to express that which is called forth by all of our disciplines. We are at the core of what is important to express as human beings. We're called the humanities because we are at the core of what we're called to be and do in the world. All the economic resources, all the, the scientific discovery has to be expressed in some way. For some it spills out in the visual arts, for some it must be acted upon the stage, for some it has a quintessential quality of melody and harmony that gives it purpose and gives it reason. We are at the core of what economic success should be about, to create, to allow, to enable expression, and that is why we are here.